Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We are here today to talk about design for assisted reality and brain computer interfaces, uh, which is just mind blowing to me and I'm sure to, to many of you as well. Um, we have our speakers here, uh, Cole Heiner, who's senior UX designer at Cognition, a designer with expertise in augmented reality and 3D interactions, who is passionate about enhancing our physical and digital worlds through more seamless, contextual, and human-centric technologies. Uh, and Sandra Fang, our UR design, AR design prototyper at Cognition, uh, who is, uh, she bridges design and development, she crafts immersive utility uh, and creative experiences, and she's a pioneer in assisted reality using BCI and AR to facilitate communication for ALS patients. Um, so uh, thank you all so much for joining, and I'm going to pass it to Cole to take us away. All right. Thank you, Dylan. Really excited to be here today um, at this event, and uh, excited to um, share some of our work with you all. So without further ado, I'll get right into explaining this and um, give you some context uh, sort of about what we're doing at Cognition. Um, so for uh, just an introduction, um, uh, we're designing interactive experiences and this is a, our Cognition One device. So it's a uh, accessibility focused uh, augmented reality headset, which also has um, brain computer interface integration. And um, as uh, the design team, uh, Sandra and I and our other teammates, we, you know, we've um, got this amazing opportunity to work with a lot of other uh, brilliant, brilliant teammates and um, prototypers, researchers. Uh, we work a lot with engineering and um, product uh, to 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 build this out, and um, it's been really exciting. So we're gonna uh, be sharing a bit of um, how our design process has uh, sort of looked, and and what uh, the thinking is that has gone into um, uh, the the creation of this. So just a little bit about our team. Uh, shout out to all the amazing designers who um, have made this possible. Um, and Tim Stutz, our design director, Kathy Liu uh, uh, from the beginning has helped us so much. We've got Daniela, um, our uh, fabulous researchers, Jonathan, Emily, Ivan, all supporting. And of course myself and Sandra. Um, uh, and so we'll be going into um, a bit about where we kind of started with uh, the headset and sort of the progression of um, in the in the early uh, sort of um, design stages, we we've, we've been looking at um, supporting uh, users who may have sort of motor or vocal uh, disabilities, so varying levels of ability to speak. Um, here we have Chris Benedict, who's wearing the device. Chris is a fantastic uh, sort of spokesperson and advocate for the community who we work closely with. Um, he has really valuable res uh, sort of perspective that he can lend to the device. And Chris is fairly verbal, so he might not necessarily rely on a device like this for, for the majority of his communication, but can use it kind of to supplement that. Um, and uh, yeah, so we started with this Speak Pros um, AR, which is uh, sort of uh, assumes that the, the wearer will have some ability to move their head um, that's sort of the, the primary way that the interaction occurs is looking at a target and dwelling on it. But there's a number of things you can adjust there depending on uh, the, the range of motion that a, a user might have. So, um, and yeah, and as you can see, the way Chris is communicating here, he's typed out this message um, using a, a keyboard that's, uh, we'll see how it looks in AR in a second here. And then the message can be um, vocalized. So it's, it's a speech generating device. Um, and uh, he can look out and see other people in the room. And then that message also gets projected uh, so that they might not only hear it, but, but can see um, what he's spoken. Okay, and um, this is a look like when we sort of, uh, a lot of us first joined the team, um, there was an existing sort of Speak Pros app. I think you could still find it on, um, on the uh, Apple store. Um, but we were bringing it sort of into AR and sort of doing some uh, refinements there to make it work more for that particular medium. You can see some of the early uh, versions of it were a little bit more um, focused on a younger audience, almost like a pediatric type audience. So we were 
tasked with taking that and there was a lot of great foundation there, but we just wanted to update it, bring it, make it more usable. And so um, we'll be going through sort of that process a bit before we um, dive into some, some further examples. Uh, and then I've got a video here, which uh, I'll just let this play and kind of talk about. This is sort of the, the uh, design that we updated. I'm gonna pause the sound, but as you can see, we've got a keyboard with some level of um, not only word prediction, but phrase prediction. So um, as you're typing, you'll, you'll see that uh, a lot of times you don't have to type out the full word or even sentence. Um, you can speak something. And in this case, we do have IoT integration with Alexa. So uh, here we've, we've got some music playing in the background now. Um, and we have some helpful ways of organizing uh, the, the communication. So you can see, like, you can save things to your favorites. There's a history you can go into and some phrase management that I'll um, dive further into in a bit. Um, but yeah, we've got some interesting features like with the Alexa integration where you can uh, you can ask about the weather. And uh, as you can see here, it's um, it's actually pretty nice out. So, um, but yeah, you can get some uh, some cool interactions that way, all from the ease of using that keyboard and then sending the message out. We also have settings where you can go in and make a number of adjustments um, to make this better suited to your particular needs. Um, so the, the way that we're targeting here, you have a dwell timer and you can make it longer or shorter depending on your preference. You can scale up the interface and make it bigger so it's easier to read. Um, and yeah, we've got uh, again here um, just showing some of the ways that you can you can integrate with different IoT features. Um, a cool thing too is since what you speak gets projected out into the audience, even if we don't have direct integration with something, um, if you have a, a smart device in your environment already that can listen. So here I've got um, the TV in the background. Here's me say I want to watch Star Trek, and then it'll pull it up on the screen behind it. Um, then we can hide the interface so it gets out of the way nicely, and um, you can get to watching whatever show you might like. Okay, and then for this next video, um, this is a little bit further along where we're going to show kind of more of a typical conversation back and forth, and I'm going to hopefully um, you'll, you'll hear the sound on this one. I'll turn that on so you can kind of see. I'll just say like... Um, Pay attention to how the uh, the interface is positioned so that we've taken a lot of care to ensure that it's down below. How are things going? Um, I'm talking here to to Chris, Not who's going to. Not too gonna... bad. Uh, how about yourself? How are things going with you, Colt? You can see then I've got some things in my history that might be useful, so I can quickly pull up um, uh, some conversational elements that I might have I'm used in the great. past. That's good to hear. Let's play a game. Sure. Uh, what do you want to play? We got we got chess. We got checkers. Uh, what are you feeling? Chess. All right. So yeah, I'll set the pieces up. Chris is gonna then help me to set up the chess game. I'm gonna give him an uh, emoji thumbs up. Oh, and he gives me one too. So not only can we uh, type things out. Um, we can also use some some interesting fun things like emojis to express ourselves this way. And so yeah, that was sort of an example of how you would see it in context. Um, the Speak Pros interface. Oh, how do I get to the next slide here? Okay, there it is. All right, so um, I'll go into a few of the things we just saw a little bit more. Um, probably the one of the most important parts is the the keyboard it's front and center it's right there but as you'll notice it's a little bit below the eye level of the, of the um, person you might be speaking to and the wearer themselves in their field of view we wanted it to not obfuscate or block the environment so that you, you still have a view of what's going on around you um, but it needs to be big enough it needs to be comfortable target sizes and um so we we put a lot of thought into the design and the layout here with the keys being sort of in this grid fashion can make targeting a lot a lot easier a lot faster um, things are kind of close together but not you know too close that it's uh, uncomfortable um, and we've got uh, 
we do have a few different keyboard layouts. We explored a number, um, some of which were pretty uh, exotic and exciting. But uh, what we found is that most of um, the users we interviewed uh, preferred either QWERTY or, or sometimes alphabetical. So we do have in the settings a way to, to change that and to pick your preference. In the future, we could, we could also support um, uh, whatever layouts might be, might be the most useful, but the QWERTY is sort of what we uh, default to. And then um, we also have uh, a sort of like, almost like a library of, uh, if you have phrases that you use often and you'd like to either save or favorite them, um, you can go in here. Uh, we've got some sections off to the side um, of the keyboard where you can see things that you recently spoke. You can save and sort of bring in your own vocabulary. Um, we have a way of sorting and filtering it. Um, this is something that, you know, um, there's a lot of a lot of different ways we could probably do this, but we really tried to keep it simple so that you can kind of find some of the the more important categories that you might use in your day to day conversations. Um, so here we've got you know a couple of different filters. Um, you can you can use these tags to uh, select uh, kind of set the context and and hopefully find something. But um, we we've been iterating on this and uh, do hope to continue to take feedback and make this even better. Um, so yeah, uh, this is, um, kind of a, a, a bit of a way of like organizing your, um, your larger vocabulary. And then, um, really important as well is the settings. So, uh, within the settings, we do have a number of things you can adjust, um, related to even selection, which can be done as you saw with the gaze and dwell type interaction, you look at a target you rest on it for a period of time, and then it selects. But uh, given that not everyone has the same um, range of motion there, or we'll have different preferences, we can change the timing. We can also integrate with a, a switch uh, type device where you can you can trigger like a selection separately. If you're looking at something, you can click a button um, or whatever uh, you might be able to pull in for that. Um, we have ways of changing the size, the overall scaling of the interface can, can go up or down. Um, and we have some uh, interesting settings related to the actual predictions. You can hide or show those. We have a way to clear the history, um, enable autocorrect features, and then uh, some features related to audio and haptics, as well as the, as you saw, the, the Alexa integration can be um, enabled or disabled. And um, yeah, so as we we're designing this, uh, we were taking sort of elements of what um, was initially designed for a 2D application on a tablet and bringing it into AR, where we have this really interesting added element of depth. And so um, as you can see here, uh, we have different levels where the interface sits. And this has all been designed around our unique um, optics. So uh, we, we use a device where the optimum kind of um, focal plane is set, you know, maybe a little more than half a meter away from you. We really want to keep content at least that far away because otherwise if it, if it comes too close, it can be very uncomfortable to look at for a long period of time. But if it's very far away, like across the room, it doesn't really feel like it is in your personal space. Um, so we've, we've taken care to design this in a way where um, if the settings open out or there's a the phrase manager opens out, those will kind of have unique depth to them. And um, there's kind of like a hierarchy there. We have our status bar below um, and facing up toward the user so that it, it remains as legible as possible. So legibility is a really um, uh, a, a big uh, important factor here. And, and we want to make sure that um, everything is working to optimize that. Another part of um, designing this, uh, we have like, I guess, a field of view where um, depending on the device, uh, the field of view may be different. Um, and ours, we wanna keep the content within that frame. So um, in order to do that, we, we want to sort of have the UI uh, move with the user. And if, if it gets too far out of the frame and you can't interact with it, that's no good. So we, we've devised a number of different um, kind of motion mechanics in order to, to make sure that the, the interface will be visible and accessible. Um, it's not gonna be too far away um, from where you can move comfortably. 
Um, so in this example, we didn't actually end up um, implementing this particular design, but this was an early study about, you could almost compare it to mouse sensitivity or something where um, if you can't move quite as far with your head, we can actually, uh, in, we can bring up the, the sensitivity of the cursor um, so that it can travel a little bit farther. Um, so you'll see there's kind of like one to one motion and then one to two, one to three. Uh, where it's actually the cursor is moving much farther than the head rotation moves. So these are some features that we can dial in in the settings. And this is um, maybe a bit, a bit more advanced. Um, in our first pass, we sort of took uh, just the one-to-one -one approach, but um, always thinking about ways that we can improve there. And then in this example, this is um, showing sort of how the UI will catch up to the user. If they move their head past a certain point, it has this tag along or following kind of um, behavior so that it'll never get too far away, but you still need to be able to move your head to target the elements. So there's kind of a, a threshold there that we've designed with this nice um, gentle motion to catch up to, to where the user is looking after they've changed um, position or rotation. Okay. And um, yeah, I, I just wanted to also uh, describe some of the, the ways that we've prototyped these, um, these kind of interfaces. What we found is that before we had a lot of things in AR, we actually, um, we did a lot of work in VR kind of simulating what it would feel like to see things at scale. And scale is really important when you're designing for spatial computing. Um, if something's too big or too small, it's very, very hard um, to interact with or to, or to even uh, read. Um, so we used uh, this wonderful app called Shapes XR, which if you haven't tried and you have a, um, a VR device, I would highly recommend getting in. You can work as a team. We are a team that's situated across the globe. We've got um, folks in Canada, folks across um, the states here. And it was really, um, really interesting. We could jump into Shapes XR and sort of um, they integrate with Figma. So we could take our 2D designs and start to put them into the 3D world, we could simulate a FOV to get a sense of like, well, how much content is actually going to be visible and um, just do a lot of iterations this way. Uh, and you can join, it's all networked. So you can kind of get the full team and the experience. Um, I, I would highly recommend, I think it was very, very helpful in our kind of early stages of, of prototyping. And we also did um, a bit of uh, user testing along the way to ensure that essentially things are legible. Um, we needed to establish kind of a baseline on our unique optics, like what, what is legible? Um, and how big do fonts need to be? How thin or thick can we go? What colors? What's the right amount of contrast? And so um, we, we sort of found like um, some ranges of that uh, for the majority of the folks we did test with um, in the sort of representative uh, user, like target user base. Um, we, we were able to build out our system font at a default level that most will be able to, um, to uh, interact with out of the box. But if not, we can always scale it up um, or choose like a, a larger size if needed. But, um, but we never go below a certain size there or a certain uh, contrast. We, we always try to maintain that. Um, and uh, yeah, and also having um, icons and symbols, if those get too small, they can be very hard to read. So we were um, careful to ensure that uh, we we make those um, big enough for uh, for them to be legible. And uh, some of the user research and testing we did, um, we conducted uh, user studies with um, a number of participants, sort of like um, in the early stages, who uh, who helped us get those kind of baseline numbers of what the text size should be. We um, we gathered a lot of feedback from that, made adjustments accordingly. Um, as here you see a, a, one of our um, users trying out the uh, the Speak Pros AR um, application, and um, we've got uh, I think this is Tim at Asha. Uh, he's interviewing a number of um, speech language pathologists, getting their feedback as well. So talking with users and experts um, to get their impressions. Okay, and um, just making sure we're good on time here, but uh, yeah. Uh, Few more parts about this. Um, we have 
uh, a number of specifications that we've created over um, the course of, you know, uh, the project where um, typically we're building these flows out in, in Unity. Um, we take our, usually our 2D designs from Figma and bring them into, um, into the Unity engine where they become 3D. Um, and so in order for that to happen, we actually have to kind of come up with a, a way of um, converting from like pixels essentially to millimeters. And so what we try to do there is have a kind of one-to-one -one ratio. So if you have, you know, one pixel can equal one millimeter, and then we can set that at a common depth, like one meter away. That way we can easily do the math. If we, if we need to scale it, we can, you know, we can bring things closer or push them farther out and quickly get, um, get sort of uh, a, a larger um, uh, pixel resolution if we need to, if it's farther away or, or less pixels if it comes closer. Um, so yeah, we, did, we had some crazy numbers there before we implemented something a little more sane uh, for those conversions. But yeah, uh, ultimately, as I was saying, that all comes into Unity and uh, the design team, um, especially Sandra and Danny have, have been amazing about um, sort of getting in there and we work very closely with the engineers. Um, but we're also able to take our designs and 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 sort of put them directly into um, the game engine and, and see how things are looking, position them accordingly. Um, so it's a it's a bit of an iterative process. Um, but yeah, we've uh, really uh, developed a, a nice system over time where we can um, we can try out different designs and and colors and sizes and and uh, iterate that way. Okay, and so I think at this point, I've sort of um, hit on kind of the early stage of um, uh, we developed the Speak Pros AR uh, app initially, and um, that was targeting users who, who do have some range of motion um, as their uh, uh, ability to uh, verbalize might fall off, uh, they can use it. Um, but uh, we wanted to get into sort of the next stage of what we're thinking about um, and so uh, we're we're looking at with the BCI side, um, targeting uh, more like users who have um, ALS or some some stage of um, I guess ALS is where your motor neurons are actually uh, degenerating over time in these kind of stages where early on you might lose ability to speak. You, this can come in sort of different phases, but typically it's characterized by. Um, loss of speech, slurred speech, and then movement becomes more difficult over time. And in the later stages, breathing and um, even sort of like eye uh, control can go. So um, so in order to support that uh, sort of state in the latter stages, um, where you may not have really much voluntary motor control at all, um, we're going to be uh, leaning more towards the BCI um, brain computer uh, interface uh, to, to really enable communication and uh, return agency to, to those users. So with that being said, I think I'll hand it over to Sandra, who can kind of um, carry us through the, the BCI side. Anything else you want to add there, Sandra, or I can go to the next slide? Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thank you, Cole. Um, I'm Sandra, the AR design prototyper at Cognition. Um, so I'm just going to dive into the BCI side of things. Um, so for BCI, uh, what we've done so far is to uh, collect the uh, occipital uh, lobe um, EEG data. So if you think about where occipital lobe is, is basically the back of your head. And that's where the visual cortex um, is located. Um, so that's where that's uh, the area that we collect the user's EEG data to understand uh, what the user's focus is at. Um, so at the next slide, um, I just want to talk a little bit about what, um, how does BCI work, right? So I don't know if everybody here um, have a, a good understanding of BCI. So what we use, we call it uh, the SSD TBCI. Um, so the, in terms of the workflow, uh, the flow, I'm just going to do an annotation here. If you guys see, um, there's a little guy here. So this is the user. Um, so the user would look at an SSD EP. So you can think of SSD EP as a visual uh, stimulus. So when the user is looking at SSD EP, um, the user's brain will uh, generate some kind of uh, 
brain uh, EEG data. So when the data is, so that data will be collected by um, our sensor. And then from there, uh, we have all kinds of algorithm to like process the EEG data to understand what it means. So once we have that done, uh, we'll translate into some kind of command. Uh, and this command will then circle back uh, into uh, the um, external device. In this case, uh, for us is the um, our headset. And then from there, we can um, execute uh, a lot of things here. Um, so for the user here um, is mostly don't have motor capability, uh, but what we are monitoring is what is user, where is the user's attention, right? And then also um, how, where is the user's focusing um, over time? Um, so if you wanna play the video quickly, um, I just wanna dive a little bit into what is a uh, stimulus. Uh, we call it steady state visual evoke potential. So I'm not gonna explain what this means, but uh, in short, it's basically um, you have a, a visual that can go from positive to negative uh, at a given um, frequency. Um, so what frequency is, if you can look at the, the, uh, the wave here um, on the slide, in this one, um, we have a frequency at seven hertz. So basically an undulate from positive to negative seven times in the span of one second. Um, so this is how the, um, the stimulus work. And then on the uh, right-hand side, you see the white uh, graph here. This is how the brain would respond when it sees a seven hertz um, stimulus. Um, the brain was uh, sent off a, a seven hertz uh, EEG wave. And that's how our, uh, our uh, algorithm would understand oh, the user is looking at the stimulus. Um, so this is, uh, a, a in a nutshell, how it works. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So taking all of this knowledge um, from our design, pers as, a design uh, as a designer or on the design team, we're thinking how can we uh, translate SSVP or the BCI into something that we can easily understand um, and then fit, fit that into our current mental model. So we kind of adopted the uh, existing um, software UI mental model where we were using uh, uh, buttons. We're using SSVP sort of as but buttons. So uh, in, if you think about a classic uh, software button, you have the button at an active state uh, or idle state, right? Or at when uh, the button has been hovered, it kind of gives you a hover effect. Uh, when it's been selected, it gives you a, a selection effect. So uh, in terms of feedback, we also incorporated visual feedback as well as audio and haptic. So, um, I want to dive into also like the uh, button state life cycle as well. Um, so this is very interesting because we are uh, dealing with BCI here, right? So there's going to be some kind of transition and BCI is really interesting because it's not similar to clicking a button where you're kind of sure what you're clicking or sometimes you might make mistakes, but the percentage is very small. But for BCI, sometimes we do have false positives. So we do wanna make sure that we can reduce that uh, for our user. Um, so uh, we have the dual state, uh, which is a really interesting state here we, we defined where dual, so the dual behavior in the middle here, uh, I'm gonna try to connotate, um, right in the center here is, uh, Consisted, consisted of uh, multiple hover uh, options behaviors. So you can either have one hover or you can have multiple hover uh, based on how uh, likely a false, false positive um, could happen. And then from there, uh, we'll go to the selection. So this is how uh, we thought about um, to kind of um, bring SSVP into a, uh, into a software product. So I just wanna show you guys the a demo uh, of a quick communication tool that we've designed. Uh, just let me turn off this. 
Yeah. So this is a, a yes, no, rest demo, uh, where this is a tool that we can uh, put a user to quickly yes. communicate uh, their intention. Basically, yes. Uh, for example, if you ask a user, oh, do you like to go out? No. Quickly communicate yes or no using this device. Um, and then if you would like to take a break, uh, you can select rest, where uh, you sort of go into this um, relaxing uh, in state and then you can come back. So this is a really quick demo of the uh, yes, no rest. Um, and then I want to, so this is not, um, there's a lot of challenges uh, like leading to this, to, de to design, develop this product. So I want to dive into some of the challenges that we have um, experienced uh, in the next slide. So the first challenge is we're thinking what, how can we uh, design SSVP, right? We know that uh, the classic SSVP are usually solid color that are uh, switching between one color to the next color and then uh, to the, to the, uh, the color of uh, the previous color. But what we're thinking, because we're designers, we want something that are a bit more uh, sort of relaxing and pleasing for the user to look at, but still remain effective. So uh, what uh, we, done, we did here is um, I kind of wrote a shader in Unity where um, in this material, you're able to uh, sort of um, present to uh, program uh, multiple versions of, of stimu stimuli um, so that we can quickly test out uh, the effectiveness of each design. Um, so in this, the video on the right um, are three examples of the SSVPs we've tested. Um, so yeah, so these are the rationale here is mostly playing with the contrast. So the positive and negative color contrast. Uh, and, uh, but they kind of have a different, uh, like a different um, style to it. So in the next slide, we uh, had we conducted a, a bunch of internal uh, testing uh, with our internal user. Uh, you can see uh, Tim on the right here, um, and uh, we started collecting data. So we, yeah, we I think we tested with uh, like fifteen or twenty internal users. Everybody kind of just jumped in, uh, and then we have some interesting results uh, in the next slide where uh, we kind of determined uh, the performance of these uh, stimuli. So obviously the, the highest performance is the solid color change. Um, and then the medium performance are sort of the uh, solid color change, but kind of softened up uh, with the gradient effect. So these are uh, easier to look at. Uh, they're not as uh, straining uh, to the eyes, but however, um, the signal that it generates, it's, it, they're a bit lower than the solid colors. And then we have the lowest, I guess the lowest performing ones um, we, where we have the center to uh, cut off. Uh, and then you have like the kind of rotation um, effect to it. So that's a bit of a, that's almost like a adaptive uh, checkerboard in a sense. Um, but this one though, the SSVP is mostly generated by the low contrast um, color change and as well as by the peripheral re, uh, vision. Um, so I guess I understand why the performance is low here. Um, yeah, so these are just, just on the SSVEP front, right? So based on this result, we kind of uh, picked the uh, medium performance uh, SSVP as well as a high performance one, which is the solid color change. So we had two options uh, for the user based on their familiarity uh, with the with the BCI, um, so this is just on the SSVEP front. Uh, but then we also have to uh, determine the uh, spatial uh, design requirement uh, in the next slide. So uh, when you talk about uh, ALS patients, a lot of them are not able to move their head. So we want to make sure that the content are head locked. So traditionally, for any XR device, head locked. Uh, content are not common or not recommended. But in this case, uh, it's very uh, important to have the content positioned uh, 
in the user's field of view. Um, and then we also need to uh, make sure that the user is able to see who they're conversing with uh, and then be able to uh, view their surrounding area. Um, and then, so this is another one, the second aspect. The third uh, challenge that we are solving is how do we actually communicate with the onlooker in the next slide uh, where we have uh, the external display. So I just wanna quickly mention the kind of headset that we're using right now. Uh, we're using a mirror lens. Um, so the mirror lens can create a, um, a stereoscopic view where we have our internally designed and made uh, housing that um, will uh, contain a display. Um, so on the display here, uh, we will show like the rendered speech, right? If the user is saying hello, uh, it'll print out on the display. And if the user says yes, uh, it will print out a front and center. So this is vital for the onlooker to be able to see. Um, and in terms of the state notification, for example, when the user is responding, um, which is, uh, which is, I wouldn't say it's a critical uh, notification, but it's something if the onlooker wants to see, um, they can go closer to see what the uh, what the patient is doing. Um, yeah, so I just want to show you the, in the next slide of a demo of our uh, VP engineering <laughs> trying out this yes no resident Are you office. wearing a fedora? No. Are you wearing a BCI headset? Yes. Yeah, so in this case, uh, you can see how... Is Hawaii an island? There's a hover effect. And then yes. you have to select again to be able to uh, actually make a selection. If you want to take a break, you can select rest. And all of these selections are made by using the using your brain, right? So it's basically based on your focus, uh, and you really need to stay focused to, in order to be able to. When you're ready, you can select here. wake to go back to the yes no screen. Yeah. So this is a quick demo on our yes no rest. So. This tool is a really simple and, and quick tool to help the user communicate. Are you wearing a fedora? So in the next section, I want to talk a little bit about complex uh, composition. It's the language composition. Um, so there are many challenges that we faced that we actually solved with uh, our engineers, with our uh, designers on the team. Um, so in the next slide, uh, we have a quick demo of the uh, keyboard that we've, um, we've designed and developed. How are you today? So again, we have our uh, VP engineering typing out a response using the keyboard. Uh, and then we have our uh, language prediction uh, model that are predicting uh, the type of phrases that he is, uh, he wanted to communicate. So this is a short uh, demo of the keyboard. Um, so I want to dive into some of the challenges that we faced. Uh, so How are you today? So because it's complex, uh, we kind of need to, uh, we, we require, it requires more SSVEPs to be presented to the user. So the first challenge we have is to really find the FOV. So we had a rough idea of what the FOV is. However, uh, when you're dealing with flashing SSVP, the criteria for FOV is a lot more stringent. Um, you need a, a zone that won't create any uh, reflections. Um, you, need a, you need a zone that doesn't have any interference. So based on that criteria, um, we started uh, doing a lot of internal testing and then ultimately 
defined a, a zone uh, which is a vertical 20 degree and a horizontal 19.5 degree um, zone to display SSVP. However, it, for our external view, you can see there are a bunch of areas where we can display non-SSVPs uh, with no issue. Um, so that's the first challenge. The next challenge is uh, we kind of also want to understand um, the relationship between SSVP and the longer text in our next, yeah, in this slide here, um, determining what kind of position should we uh, place an SSVP that that is effective and and easy to use in a software product. So we kind of had a couple, a few of ideas here, and ultimately we've decided to use uh, the option A, where you have the SSVP that's uh, sitting under the a string or a te longer text. So in a video, uh, we kind of started playing around with different um, SSVP animations uh, to see um, if we can have something that works for this, uh, for this uh, arrangement. So that's one, that's the second challenge that we faced. And the third challenge is, we were thinking how many stimuli can user control uh, realistically. So in the next slide, we uh, started doing uh, internal testing with a, uh, with a few users. Um, so in the on the left, you can see it's a it's an intermediate user. Um, so uh, this user was able to select seven stimuli uh, pretty effectively. Uh, and then on the right, we have a user that's really advanced, and she was able to select nine stimuli with relatively um, close uh, spacing in between it, each one and with uh, almost no false positive. So that's an advanced user. Um, and then in the next slide, we have our call <laughs> testing out the a prototype we built. Um, so here we have about 10 stimuli, which is way more than for advanced users, but <laughs> Ko is um, trudging along here. You can see he's making selections. Um, yeah, so based on this, these testings, right, uh, we sort of uh, decided to, could this device, we wanted to, you know, for, for the user to use, and a lot of them are either uh, ALS, a lot of them are ALS patients, and then they may not be familiar with BCI. It might be their first time to use BCI. So we uh, we thought about long and hard. Um, there's no way we can use three stimuli to support uh, complex communication. So we ultimately uh, set on a, se uh, a seven stimuli uh, composition. So this is our uh, final layout and flow. Uh, I'm not going to dive too much into it. Uh, but what, one thing I just want to point out is that uh, we sort of um, taking uh, as much uh, space as possible on the screen. Uh, I'm just on a circle, uh, one screen here, right here, um, to maximize the space of the screen um, so that uh, you can have the large, um, a large, uh, you know, SSVP uh, for the user to generate the EEG signals. Um, So uh, in the next slide, um, I also want to show you the, so yeah, so this is the, uh, the a close up view of type, what's, what it's like to type with our uh, SSVPs. So internally, we call this the T5 keyboard. So you basically have five cordings uh, to, for the users to be able to uh, type. Um, so in this case, uh, the user is trying to uh, type called dad, right? So on the left, you can see a bunch of uh, phrases, sorry, uh, words that are uh, predicted using our language uh, engine here um, so that user can select whichever uh, word that they are trying to type. Um, and once this uh, string is resolved, it'll turn into yellow. And then we have a, a wonderful icon um, to tell the user that, okay, you're good to go. And now you can speak this uh, to the caregiver.
So yeah, and then in the next slide, I want to quickly point out some of the behaviors uh, that we borrowed from our existing AAC device who are using eye tracking. So eye tracking is another uh, uh, commonly uh, used input model for uh, earlier or mid-stage ALS patients. So they're familiar with this mental model. And one interesting behavior uh, in that model is pause and resume function. So we thought about this and now we think we need to include that in our BCI communication as well. So we need to give the user the ability to pause, to take a break, because when you have SSVP flashing in front of you, uh, you can get tired pretty quickly. So um, when, uh, when a user is paused here um, and the stimuli would sort of just uh, disappear, right? So that they can take a break, uh, look at the trees a little bit, or, you know, close your eyes and relax. And then when they're trying to go back to their previous screen at the bottom, we kind of made it a little bit harder just to prevent the false positive. So this is what I talked about previously in the previous slides on um, adding an additional um, hover uh, selection to uh, extend that dual behavior. So in this case, you have two hovers. So you have to hover uh, the resume button once, and then you have to hover it again. And then you need to continue focus on this um, stimulus to be able to select it. And then once it's selected, you're going back to uh, the, the previous uh, screen. So this is a really, really um, great way to sort of prevent false positive and then to make sure that this is what this user uh, is actually trying to do. Yeah, so this is uh, the false and resume behavior. I think this is all about our uh, PCI uh, section of it. Hope I've uh, covered everything here. Uh, Cole, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I was just going to say a note on the keyboard arrangement, and there may have been some questions around that. Sorry, I need to look back. But um, the particular layout here, I think Sandra mentioned, it's like we were it, taking it T5 is sort of a um, borrowing from if you've used like the old phones that were T9. It's like we have a limited number of inputs. And um, the the arrangement here is it's not something that's very familiar. Um, but the reason we did it this way, so like B, E, S, U, V, like what that, that's a little bit, um, seems a little bit uh, new. Uh, if you're not going to see an arrangement like that coming from a different device. But um, this was because we only had five at the time. So as we uh, have learned more and updated, um, we'll probably be moving. Some of the feedback we've gotten so far is that it's sort of a confusing mental model, but this was a starting point to enable us to... Um, you know, it's like it's predicting based on you probably typed like one of these letters. And then we know because um, uh, from our language model, we can predict like what the word possibilities actually are. So it fills in, even though you're trying to say great, it might not look like the word great until you get a couple clicks in. Um, but again, this was just to, to speed up the interaction, but it may not be worth um, going faster if it's confusing. So I think we're probably going to go with more of like a, of an alphabetical or a familiar arrangement uh, in the future. Yeah, and we also have the constraint of like a number of stimuli uh, that can be presented on the screen. So that's usually, that's a major uh, factor there as well. So I think when the users are getting better at using BCI, Frankly, using BCI is a learning curve. Not everybody uh, will be an expert um, right from the right out the bat, right? So the so they need to practice. As they get better, they will be able to uh, focus better and be able to use to see or to to use uh, more stimuli on the screen uh, at one at one given time. So uh, yeah, so seven is sort of for intermediate, but in the future we'll have uh, hopefully we'll have a lot more advanced users that will be able to use 10 plus stimuli on the screen. Yeah. Um, I guess we can open up uh, some of the questions, but we also have a slide at the, after this, um, some of the just exciting news at Cognition. Uh, we recently got the FDA breakthrough uh, device designations. Um, so this is something that we are really, really excited about, uh, as well as the CMS approval um, so that uh, use, 
individuals with ALS will be able to purchase our device uh, using uh, Medicare uh, billing privilege privileges. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure uh, everybody have some questions, so we're happy to uh, to answer them here. Some folks can either go ahead and unmute uh, and ask questions or um, ask them in the chat and we'll read them off. See, I know. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there's someone that asked a question from Xin Yishu. Um, she's asked so the yes no rest functionality is based on their gaze and focus, but not cognition. So it's basically based on um, your attention, right? So when you're focused on a specific um, stimulus, your brain will generate uh, EEG waves, right? And then our sensor will pick up that EEG wave and then process it and then to understand, oh, so that is what you're looking at. So it's not really through uh, eye tracking or gaze tracking, those technologies are generally using a camera to track your eye position. But in this case, we're using the, uh, the brainwave uh, generated by your brain <laughs> to understand where, where your, uh, your focus is, yeah. Awesome, I see we have a, a question here from uh, David Ingebretson. Um, apologies if I mangled your pronunciation there. Curious uh, about people who have multiple disabilities and how they can access the user interface. Uh, for example, a blind user often use Braille and or screen readers that use text-to-speech engines. I'm thinking about people with multiple disabilities and how will blind folks with ALS use the UI? Ooh, that's a really good question. And I'm just thinking about, I mean, right now, as, as we show the stimuli, are being presented visually. However, uh, I could imagine that there may be opportunity there to think about stimuli that uh, extend into the realm of, of audio. So, so perhaps that could be an approach. Um, I think we'll definitely be curious about exploring more ways of, um, uh, you know, it's like you could think about something that you hear or you could think about something that you, we just need something there as a baseline. Um, and for now it's, it's, we've had the focus on the, the AR side and the, the visuals, but, um, but yeah, I think there's an opportunity to, to really, um, delve more into that. So, uh, yeah, more, more research to be done you know, on that. Um, I have a question. Uh, Alyssa, go ahead. Um, Melissa's friend, <laughs> uh, but for the SSVEP, uh, I guess like visual fatigue issue, I was wondering if they have to be flickering at those particular frequencies to be readable or if uh, like an occasional flash or something like that would also be detectable. It like has to be at a pretty stable uh, frequency. And usually we recommend above five Hertz. So six Hertz is actually a little low. So anywhere above seven Hertz is, you can generate good signal. So we, cause we need, because when you dive into the brain uh, wave data, there is a lot of noise. So we need a, some kind of stimulus, stimul stimulus or SSVP that can generate a strong enough signal so that our, um, machine learning model understands, oh, this is actually, the user is actually looking at something. It's just not, it's not just some kind of random noise that the head is, uh, is generating. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we have another question from David. Uh, what is the operating system and development environment you're using to create the UI? Of uh, what kind of UI are you? You talking about the Spar AR? You talking about the BCI? Um, I can just talk about the overarching environment that we're using uh, right now. They're Android. We're using Android environment. And and Unity is also Unity. Um, what we're yeah developing in for for I think yeah. most of what the we, tool that what we're we using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, so I, I'd love to ask a question here. I, I'm curious, um, you know, you guys are obviously working on this specialized device that has uh, this, you know, brain computer interface sensors to it. Um, I'm curious what you've learned that you would suggest for designers and developers working for other types, uh, creating other types of XR products, right? Whether that's, you know, Quest headsets or smartphone, AR. Um, is there anything that you've learned from this project that you would suggest for these other types of form factors that they could use to increase their accessibility? You want to take this one, Cole? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, it's a good question. And I mean, one example, I think, is just what Sandra already kind of alluded to with um, things, certain inputs can be fatiguing over time. And, um, especially with mental fixation, uh, it's something that I think we're still learning about, um, just how much you can actually in endure at a time and getting an idea for that, but just anticipating that there probably will need to be some, some built-in rest periods and, and, and periods of like onboarding is also something that when we first started using VCI, especially like I remember for myself, it was very difficult in the beginning to not get frustrated with I was making mistakes. I was having a hard time staying focused, um, but sort of like starting small, as you saw with like the yes, no rest, it's only three options. But then from there, building up confidence and, and you introduce more um, complexity, but having a way to scale that I think is, is really important that you can always fall back to something that will... Um, that will suit your ability. And, and then that can change depending on the context, the situation. Sometimes you're in a more distracting environment and you need to scale back. Sometimes you're in a really quiet environment and you can, I don't know, you can perform uh, uh, more effectively, but that would be uh, some one of, one of the many takeaways um, that uh, I, I would think just anytime you're designing for a new input modality to keep that in mind. Awesome. And I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, I see from uh, Raj Shikar Reddy here. Have you explored BCI paradigms other than SSVEP? Uh, yeah, we, we have plans to explore other um, way of generating uh, brain signals other than SSVEP. Um, not sure how much I can say here, but yeah, we're exploring. <laughs> Yeah, we're excited yeah. about some of it. In, in the yeah. in the research and the literature, there's a lot of um, interesting directions that we, yeah. we are looking into. But uh, but those results, we need to kind of validate them, and, and exactly. then we'll probably share more of that uh, at some point in the future. I hope to share more. Awesome. I'll give you one more one more question that could probably be a talk all on its own, but um, <laughs> I, I'm curious as well when it comes to you know helping people talk right and generate words um that seems like a big opportunity for generative ai right um just because it's possible to put in very quick prompt with kind of very high level stuff and come out with full english sentences in the style you want um, i'm curious if that's something that that you're exploring uh when it comes to supporting people's communication abilities yeah absolutely and um, again, I probably can't get into too much of it. We, we have a NLP team that we work very closely with on that very thing. Um, we have a sort of large language model that we can draw from, and we're exploring some different what what um, ultimately what ends up working best for uh, for a particular population. We need to continue to refine, um, but certainly, like we're finding that as you saw, like some of those BCI interactions, it can take a very long time to get just one word. And so if that word is, you know, as long as we get that and we know the context, um, we can actually generate a lot of uh, very helpful sort of like anticipate what what the uh, user might be trying to communicate and provide suggestions that way. Um, but we do want to also not fully rely on, um, you know, if the suggestions aren't necessarily in the particular voice or style of the user, we, we can always fall back to a more manual approach. It may just take longer. So I think there's a balance um, there that we're, we're looking to hit. Gotcha. All right, well, I think we are just about at time here. So we're gonna have to wrap it up, but um, thank you so much, uh, Cole, Sandra, for, for coming here today. Thank you for um, 
Andreas for answering all these questions in the chat, as well as Tim um, and uh, everybody at Cognition for the awesome work that you're doing. Um, would really encourage everybody, if you enjoyed this talk, uh, we'll, we'll put it on YouTube soon. Um, I'm also sharing our XR Access Slack uh, in the chat. So if you'd like to join our community and talk about this and other uh, exciting technologies, um, please feel free to do so. But yeah, thanks so much, Purdue, for coming, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. We uh, really appreciate this opportunity to uh, share some of what we've been up to with, with the community. Really value your input. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to get in touch via LinkedIn or email. Yeah, thank you so much for attending this uh, this talk.